Um, Marshall and I uh, have been friends and colleagues for many years back from the day when I was working with Saul Brusolo on urea cycle defects and I used to cry on Marshall's shoulder uh, pretty regularly but and vice versa. And vice versa. <laughs> If any of you have uh, worked with, with Saul, he's a wonderful person, but you'll understand. Um, <laughs> Marshall, Marshall's a Southerner, um, and he said this morning he was happy to be back in the South. He uh, spent a lot of time at Vanderbilt University, both undergraduate, graduate, um, residency in peds at uh, Vanderbilt, and then a fellow in genetics at Vanderbilt, and was there as faculty for many years. He's published over 130 papers, had multiple grants. Um, his CV is um, too much to go through in one session. Um, and he's recently um, at now at Children's DC running um, some interesting and I think interesting clinical programs and things that we can learn a lot from. So I will turn this over to Marshall. There we go. Yeah, see, I should be wearing a blue blazer and blue jeans. We could do the TED Talk thing. You know. So it's actually really nice to be back, what I consider home, which is the South. I spent the first 50 years of my life in Tennessee. So I knew I was in a different place. Um, when I order pizza from my lab, I have to get half the pizzas as vegetarian. That was just something I had never been used to before. Um, but I've, I've learned to adapt. When Pam asked me to do this talk, this one's kind of a little different from what I normally do. Um, we're kind of playing with some models around how do you do clinical genetics in DC. And we've actually had the privilege of having pretty deep economic data and budget data on what actually goes on behind the scenes. So I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about some of the global aspects of clinical genetics, but then also I want to take it local and talk about what goes on inside of practice, what are the economics, maybe give you a little ammunition to take home um, that might be useful for you. So the opinions expressed are mine alone. So if you want to listen to the observations of a physician from a U.S. Southern rural state educated at the State University, then you were warned. I don't have any conflicts on this other than the occasional existential crisis. Uh, greetings from my team in D.C. And now I want to start off with this. Um, what's the scope of clinical genetics? So when I trained in the 1980s, it was pretty obvious. We were trying to figure out what caused rare diseases, and that was about all we had really access to that had a clear phenotype. But what's genetics now? It's everything. I, I'm darn sure the neurologists all think they're geneticists. Uh, the cancer docs all think they're geneticists. Um, I even have surgeons now that think they are geneticists, which just scares the bejeebers out of me. But what I'd like to do is think about what the scope really is. And, and that's, I think, one of the things as a field we're going to have to address is what do we actually do for a living? What's a clinical geneticist? You know, what's a biochemical geneticist doing? Well, if you kind of take it this way, you think about genetic severity and you think about environmental severity and you kind of look at where you start getting the phenotype, rare disease kind of falls up here. And really that's kind of what we've always dealt with. We deal with these kind of one-offs or small uh, disease groups and everything else. Now, what's happening in the field is people are starting to look at milder and milder genetic changes as they interact with the environment. And, you know, they're calling that precision medicine. They're calling it, um, they've, got, they've got a bunch of different names for it, pharmacogenetics. Take your pick for it. So the question will be is, do we stay up here in the little corner or do we also come down here and play a little bit too? as well, and I think that's one of the things we're going to have to figure out as a field. The lessons we learn in our field are applicable across the spectrum, but at some point in time we actually kind of have to have a clinical definition or a clinical um, ballpark of what we like to play with, and I, I would make the argument that our ballpark is still up here, and that's a lot of patients still. I mean, that's a whole lot of patients. There's another thing we need to think about too, so if I had a full-blown urea cycle patient with no enzyme activity in the 1980s, the odds that they would make it internationally to five years of age were about 5% or less. Then in the 90s, that number crept up to 50%, a few new drugs, 
a little bit of improvement, saw Bruce Lowe scared us all badly, and so we started to do a little better. Then um, we started really um, doing the same thing cystic fibrosis did, which is organizing the treatment protocols, making sure we're using the drugs right, get the nutrition right. Now if we look at it, it's probably better than 95% for five-year survival. So what does that mean? Well, think about other diseases. Down syndrome in the 1980s had an um, average death of about 25. That was usually how long those patients made it. Now and the number is 56 to 60, and it's probably going to cross 60 in the next five or six years. Sickle cell anemia, same thing, rare, classic rare disease with the introduction of hydroxyurea and some better uh, clinical care. Now we've got really increased survival. Cystic fibrosis, I think we kind of all watched that story. That's kind of been the prototype where just organizing your treatment programs, getting things done the same way, picking best practices, coming up with a few new medical ideas, but really just kind of trying to apply the best you can do. Huge increase in survivability. So, Genetics now has gone from this acute diagnose this emergency, but that patient's not going to be around very long, is now a chronic disease field. How many of you are trained in pediatrics? You know, most, most of you. How many of you are trained in adult medicine? One, yeah. All right, so there's a forward-looking individual back there. Anybody trained in geriatrics? There we go. So as you can see, a small percentage of our folks are actually able to take care of our patients as they get older. And the children's hospitals that a lot of us work in also will tend to throw up their hands. And we're, I've been fortunate we're allowed to see cradle to grave where we are, but I know for a lot of programs, these patients get to 20 and they say, well, we'll stretch you to 25. You get to 25, they say, mm, sorry, you're out of luck. So what's a rare disease? Um, FDA definition, which is what most people work with in the U.S., is under 200,000 or about one in 1,659, I think, so last time I did the math on this. Europe uses a 1 in 2,000. I think with the new versions of the Orphan Drug Act, we'll probably go to 1 in 2,000 also. My definition is a disease uncommon enough that a general practitioner would not be expected to be familiar with it or how to treat it, which I think kind of is a good working definition for that. Last time I checked on OMAM, there's over 8,000 of the darn things. Um, used to be we could molecularly diagnose only a handful of these. Now we can diagnose diseases we literally have no names for. Um, they are clinical collections of symptoms that we have found a gene change for. This has created an information flow problem in the field that really centers around these rare disease patients because the majority of these conditions fall well under this 200,000 mark and uh, really don't have a medical home. I mean, a lot of the patients do have a medical home. You know, CF has got pulmonary medicine, rare congenital heart disease has got cardiology, et cetera, et cetera. All the rare cancers have the oncologist. Um, but for the bulk of these 8,000 diseases, kind of we're it. So why should you care about rare disease? Um, well, first off, you're a geneticist, so you better care about it. 90% um, of them are genetic, 30% according to your order, die before the age of five. It takes about 7.6 uh, years average time to diagnose in the United States. This is from a rare disease impact report. Uh, two to three misdiagnoses along the way, four primary care physicians, four specialists. We've all had those patients that bounce from place to place to place before they get a diagnosis. The NIH and uh, Steve Groft would, and Ann Parisher would say it's 8 to 10 percent of the U.S. population. I think if you count rare hangnail disease, maybe you get up to 8 to 10 percent. I think a realistic number is more like 3 to 4. You're still talking 5 to 10 million patients, though. It's a lot of people. Is rare disease a unique field of medicine? So this is one of my theses that I've been working on for the last few years. So our con the conditions are typically monogenetic or contiguous. The evidence is based on small number of patients. Our evidence for practice care is almost completely different from what mainstream uses. You know, literally, we will have a population study of five patients, and that is actually the population. It's not a sample. It's not a representative sample. It's the freaking population. And getting people's heads around that is really hard to do. I work a lot with the FDA, and every so often the committees will just throw up their hands saying, we need more patients. I said, well, unless you're going to have some form of uh, human uh, recombinant program here, you're not going to get any more other than that, and they still don't like it. There's limited incidence data. We see a lot of round numbers when we see how common a particular disease is. Newborn screenings help tidy that up some, but we'll do a lot of one in 50,000, one in 100,000. 
things like that. Um, patients and families are typically our best source of information. Uh, the genetic heterogeneity means that even within a small group, uh, the patients will be quite different from each other. I had urea cycle patients that present at 48 hours. I've had them that presented at 85 years of age, both with urea cycle disorders. So there's lots and lots of variation. By the way, if anybody wants a copy of these slides, I'm happy to share them. There's nothing secret in here if you need it, if, if, if you really want to bother with it. Um, typically, they're seen by highly specialized caregivers. They'll use multiple specialties with coordination for the diseases. Care expertise is limited. I mean, this is it for the Southeast, guys. And this is, you know, I, I know from my own memory, this is about it. And these are lifespan diseases, too. This isn't like an infectious disease you treat and get over. This isn't like a cancer where you have a really intense period, but then you go on to do something else. You know, you get one of these, you've bought a lifetime disease. Here's the other reason we need to pay attention to this. Um, Everyone, how many of y'all are involved in a precision medicine program? I don't, Mike, you don't need to raise your hand. Um, but one of the things that's happening is we're taking common diseases and we're breaking them down into rare genetic conditions. So for instance, if you take breast cancer at 150 per 100,000 per year and you divide that into 30 molecular subtypes, those subtypes actually fall under the threshold of rare diseases, actually quite well under the threshold. So more and more, Common diseases are coming to look for regulatory agencies, funding agencies, like rare diseases. One of the reasons Humira has eight orphan designations um, for the drug, even though it's commonly used for some other things. This is one of the things we're going to have to figure out, is where are some of the boundaries between what's a rare disease and what's not a rare disease. And I think we may have to go back to some of the old definitions. Uh, I don't know how to define a dirty movie, but I know it when I see it. Not that I watch dirty movies. but. <laughs> I use a different word in the Northeast because they don't understand the concept of dirty movie. Um, so let's talk about some of the economic impact of this. Uh, so if you look, this is an article that Sean McCandless did that really was, I think, one of the better ones from the economic standpoint. They looked at all the admissions to Rainbow Babies Hospital for an entire year. And they drilled down for their, what the patient had while they're admitted. 34% of the patients admitted had a clear genetic condition, not a contributor of a genetic condition, had a clear genetic condition. It's 51% of all hospital bills. 81% of the hospital bills with at least a genetic determinant. So it's a massive impact. And actually, we've kind of doing some similar type work, and I'll share a little bit of what we've done. But this is consistent. This is actually true. So its impact on public health, this comes out of Western Australia. And they have a very limited population. Everybody's in their registry system there because of the way they work their health care over and around Perth. 4.6%, um, and this is across all age ranges now. This is adults and children. So 4.6 of their patients hospitalized had a rare disease. And they came up with a list of CPT or ICD codes that were for rare disease and looked at that. Is 9.9% .9 of their hospital discharges. 10.5% of their hospital costs. So the impact is out there. I mean, when, and, you know, when you start talking billions and billions of dollars, that's actually a significant amount of money. Um, I'm, I think, required by the union to show you a picture of Moore's Law if we talk anything about sequencing or anything else genetics. But have you heard of EROM's Law? Um, actually, I got this slide from Chris Austin over at NCATS and NIH. This actually shows the development of new therapies per billion dollars in the uh, US drug market. And actually, and this is corrected for current dollars, the number of drugs we get for a billion does not get you what it used to. We get fewer and fewer drugs per billion dollars. And that trend's been going on since the 1960s. So now when you get a billion, you don't get so many drugs, except in rare disease. And this has a lot to do with the passage of the Orphan Drug Act in 1983. You get a bunch of incentives like exclusivity, tax incentives, fee waivers. Some fast track, the tax incentives aren't as good as they used to be, but that hasn't really seemed to impinge yet. Um, prior to that act, there were only 10 total drugs in the 10 years prior for rare disease that were approved. So almost nothing before that. Since that time, let's talk about two things. One, how many disorders can we now diagnose with a molecular basis? You know, we were kind of talking about this earlier, not so much back in the 80s and 90s. It was kind of like, it looks like that, and therefore, since I have gray hair, it is that. And now we actually can diagnose 6,000, actually more like 8,000, if you start adding them all up together. 
we have therapies for about five to six hundred of those. So jobs, for the young folks in the audience, job security. You got a lot of work to do. And then you got to figure out what all those molecular defects mean and everything else. Now, if we look at the number of orphan drug approvals, though, it's kind of following that same pattern. You know, way back here, around the time of the Orphan Drug Act, almost 50% now of the drugs approved, actually this number peaked out at 77 for 2017. This is coming out of the FDA site. Um, almost half the drugs approved by FDA are for rare orphan disease now. Now, what is defined by that? Guess what? Our friends in the cancer field still rule. Um, that's about 60% of the drugs for orphan designations are for oncology, but the rest were other metabolism, neurology, kind of the dog's breakfast of stuff you would expect from us. But this is kind of our stuff in here. What size is the drug market in orphan disease? So it's kind of funny. If you take all of the people in uh, the clinical field of genetics and you paid them all a million dollars a year in the United States, you would probably end up spending about five to eight billion dollars tops. The orphan drug market is currently worth 160 billion. Um, now remember, a lot of that's oncology, uh, but even if you take 50% off the top, that's still some serious change here. Um, it's 12.5% of the market currently. It's forecasted to be 21% by 2022, or about 209 billion. The average cost per year of an orphan drug is $140,000. Um, interestingly enough, of a non-orphan drug, it's 27,000. That number, that would actually number was surprisingly high. I thought this is actually out of the Evaluate Pharma from 2017. Uh, rare disease clinical genetics is about four to five percent of this after you subtract out cancer and other things of some of the uh, percentages of the market. Oh. There we go. So let me now talk about local economics. This is kind of fun to throw. Uh, when you live in Washington, D.C., you learn that you have to do these kind of shock and awe slides, you know, 10%, $20 billion. You know, and then you see 20 billion and they don't really blink, and then you go, oh crap. <laughs> <laughs> so my wife, who's a lifetime pediatrician, actually works on the Hill in the United States Senate right now. And the story, the, our dinner conversations get really interesting. Um, so local economics, I'm talking a little bit about margin loss in a genetics practice, uh, down, the art of detecting downstream revenue and how that can work for you, because I've made it work for me. And then I want to talk, is the field faltering and what can we do about it? So the practice model we use in D.C., I've kind of based on every mistake I've made over the last, you know, since 1985. So we actually have our physicians and counselors team up as permanent uh, work teams. They see the same patients together. Sometimes the counselors lead if it's a counseling case. If it's you know, more medical, the docs lead, but they all do the same thing. Patient satisfaction goes through the roof when you do this because, let's face it, the counselors are really good at making sure the patients get good, timely information. A full clinic day in ours is 10 patients. This is Germaine. I want to show you some of the data we're going to look at. It's usually five and five or six and four for new for versus follow-up. A full-time clinician in our practice is three clinic days per week. The on-call physician does not see outpatients, but considering we'll see 120 to 150 inpatients a month, um, the inpatient service is quite busy. Uh, the newborn screening program is run by our nurse practitioner, and we are actually about to hire another one. Uh, given this, we're, uh, when we do the productivity markers in crimson, we're kind of at the 99th percentile, and there's only eight people in crimson from genetics. So I think that means from a productivity standpoint, we're doing okay. Uh, this just kind of shows you variations on this coming from uh, 2010 up to 2006. Um, this year, we're actually going to top out at about 850 patients a month uh, on average, and then the uh, inpatients are coming up to or close to around 200 uh, per month as well, too, as that practice has grown some. So we stay busy. What's nice, though, is that the counselor and physician visits track together. Uh, a year in the economic life. So we started February 2015 and went through February, end of February 2016. We pulled every patient that had a genetics visit. We then went through and hand curated those. So we went through basically about 7,000 charts and look to see was, first off, genetics, their very first visit to children's, was it for a genetic reason? So we actually wanted, if I was going to this with the CFO, so I wanted this really, really tight. So we actually threw out everybody but about 1,400 of the patients who came specifically to see genetics, and during that time period, their first visit to children's 
was to genetics, so we were also first bill. So about 1,408 after we redacted out several thousand. We then pulled all of the financials on those patients, and I, I have to give credit to Children's on this. I don't know that I would have been able to do this at Vanderbilt, but we got the billables, we got the cost basis for all the procedures provided, we got what the cost recovery was on all the bills and everything else. So we only included revenue during that period. So one of the flaws in the study, is so if you came in February in 2016, I only had 30 days of economic data on you. And that was just the nature of what we were trying to do with that. You've got to draw the line somewhere. So we looked at revenue cycles, physician charges, hospital charges, amounts collected, um, hospital and physician revenue to get nets. So when we look at revenue, I'll just drill down on this. Uh, this is the demographics of our patients. Ma the majority of the patients, 30 percent, were under two years of age. But we also had a significant number of pa patients over the age of 20, 5 percent from 20 to 30, 4 percent 31 to 40, and about 2 percent of the patients from 41 to 82. And we got a large enough sample size from this where I think we made some interesting things. And if we looked at the larger group of patients um, that we could actually get that same data from, it, it matched up pretty well with that. Male, female, about what you'd expect, a few more males and females, this tends to hold up every year. Um, and then uh, we have a large African-American population in the district. Um, our Spanish population is growing rapidly but isn't quite there yet. Um, and then a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Um, our mix, actually interestingly enough, this mix was much more towards our private insurance than our public Medicaid patients. If you look at our whole group, we're actually 5640, this was 6333. So we should have actually had a better economic performance out of these patients than the others, and I think you'll find it's not so hot. So physician revenue, what we billed was 1,669,000 on the 1,400 patients. Now here's where it gets ugly. Um, we deal with three political entities. We deal with the state of Virginia, the state of Maryland, and the District of Columbia. So for two of those, and our two biggest um, pull areas, we're out of state. So our cost recovery on Medicaid dollars is about 23 cents on the dollar for Virginia and about 32 cents in Maryland. So um, less allowances, bad debt, and charity, we lose 938,000 of that 1.6 million off the top. So our actual net on that is $731,000. Our counselor billings were 413. Um, we actually collected about 161 on that. So. Our counselor percent recovery runs about 40%. Our physician runs about 40% as well, too. And I think that's a trend um, I'm not seeing reversing anytime soon. Now, here's where modern medical economics kicks in. And this really has a lot to do with the post-Medicare era. Most of the charges these days are not physician charges. Um, if I'm a hospital financial administrator, I do not want you empowered to have a big money stick to hold over me. So I want most of my fees in facility fees. Um, I want them butts and bed fees. I want them procedure fees, bed days, things like that. So the hospital billing for that same group of patients was 21 million. You remember, 1.6, 21 million. Their um, recovery rate was about 8,975,000 after bad debt. So they're coming ahead, $6,374 per patient they're collecting. We're collecting about $634 per patient. Now, what does it cost to provide those services? I hope this is interesting to you. It's interesting to me. <laughs> now I have to kill you all. No, sorry. <laughs> um, genetics, we don't have procedures. We don't have equipment. We don't have scopes. Almost all of the expenses of running a genetic division are salary-based. Now, the salaries I'm showing you are those attributed to taking care of those 1,400 patients. So I'm not factoring in what research people are doing, things like that. So the salary cost for seeing those patients was $1,689,000. Um, the genetic counselor salaries attributed to that, I pay my counselors well, um, is $196,000. So our operating margin, in other words, revenue minus cost, is minus $993,000, or we lose about $700 every time we see a new patient. That is a really slap you in the face kind of number, but it's a real number. Other physicians, so the people we refer to, and um, we use the model of we're like bread and milk in the hospital. 
So, you know, we would get people in the door and they see a lot of other folks. So 700 of those 1,400 patients saw a second physician. That was about three million in bills. I think the neonatologists are paid better than we are. That's a lot of who it is. But their operating margin on that is still a loss of $1,316,000 for the physician charges of seeing those patients. Now here's where you make it up. The cost, remember that um, eight million we saw on the last page for hospital facilities? It only cost them four million to provide all those services. So then the hospital clears basically five million dollars for those 1,400 patients or $3,506 per patient. So we lose 706 per patient for genetics. We lose 900, interestingly enough, for our other physician groups, but we make 3,000 here. So we clear at the end of the day the combined margin of 2,627,000 on those 1,400 patients, or we clear a positive margin of 1,866. Now, I didn't complicate this by throwing in the laboratory, because our, our, in our place, the laboratory belongs to lab medicine. Some places, laboratories work great. Some places, they lose money on them. Just kind of depends. This is strictly seeing patients, not supporting it through any other efforts. So, I actually ran this by our CFO, and actually we sort of knew this when I went to Children's in the first place, which is one of the reasons they said, hire as many geneticists as you want. They're cheap. Um, I, yep, hey, um, we are. I'll show you a little bit on that in a minute. Um, but hire as many as you want because they make a lot of money elsewhere in the hospital. Now, patients who were admitted, patients we brought as inpatients, the hospital then averaged um, $49,000 per patient positive margin after subtracting everything out. So if we bring a patient in the hospital, the hospital does very, very well on that on margin. Um, which services do we mostly uh, end up seeing? Pretty much everything. Uh, neonatology in our program probably benefits the most from our patients. Um, those are very expensive beds. Hospital has high margins on those. Uh, gastroenterology does well, ER, so on, so on. Uh, the neurologist children somehow acquired 46 pediatric neurologists, and I'm certain that 45 of them all think they're geneticists. One of them actually is a geneticist, so I don't count her in that. So we don't actually do as much neurology as I used to when we were back at Vanderbilt. That's about only 5%. So the summary, genetics net collection, $634, costing $1,300 to see the patient. So. Uh, those of you who are old Saturday Night Live fans may remember the change bank. How do we make a profit? Volume. Now, more volume actually means you actually lose more money as an individual division. But um, the hospital makes 6000 only loses 28 on cost, and makes 35 giving you that 1866 there. So you're helping float the whole boat. I'm fortunate that our senior leadership at Children's gets that, so they encourage us to do more of it. I also know a lot of places that's not. They say, oh, you evil geneticists losing us so much money on that. Well, now you've got hard data saying you don't. Okay, and from a fairly sizable practice, I think we probably have as much volume as anyone out there. Um, workforce, since 1982, only 1,500 physicians have achieved board certification in clinical genetics. Uh, the American, I, my salute to the American Board of Medical Genetics for sharing some of this data with us. 324 in biochemical genetics. As the immediate past president of SIMD, I think we're actually down to under 100 folks uh, clinically active in the field right now in biochemical genetics. And I'm hoping it's stabilized. Uh, but if you've got a biochemical genetic certification and a pulse, you can get a job. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've had flat numbers of professionals passing the medical genetics boards, kind of plateaued in 99. There is also a big shortage of genetic counselors. There's only 3,800 in the field. The, um, do you know what the admission rate is now for applicants to genetic counseling programs? It's actually now harder to get in a counseling program than it is medical school. It's under 4% on the acceptance rates. So that they have not increased the number of slots. And even if they continue, um, they're probably not gonna meet demand until 2024. Do you know what the fill rates run on genetic uh, physician training slots? what the fill rate is for fellowships? 50%. Yeah, right around 50%. All right, so what's going on? Well, we've been looking at this. 
Some of it's lifestyle. You know, the butter spread, you know, spread the butter thin model of staffing. When you have two to four physicians per site, everyone's running all the time. Uh, the workload versus compensation is adverse. Uh, you know, I would say that people in our field are better than anyone else I know. You guys are selfless, self-sacrificing, and um, the system is kind of taking advantage of you for that. And then I say millennials, but I don't say millennials in a bad way. In fact, I might actually say the millennials may be a lot smarter than us older folks. They're actually looking for work-life balance. They're actually not willing to say, no, I'm going to stay here all day, all night, all the time. I don't judge my sense of self-worth by how long I'm at the hospital. You know, I mean, that, that game, how long were you here last night? I was here till midnight. No, I was here till two. I never left. <laughs> yeah. The other thing that's hurting us is debt. Um, Janet Loring from Bloomberg did an analysis on that. The average medical school graduate now has $170,000 uh, in debt. In corrected dollars, um, it's uh, $13,000 in 1978 or $50,000 in 2012 dollars. So, there's a lot more debt that they're carrying. They have to make economic choices that we didn't have to do once upon a time. And then money. Uh, starting salary for a pediatrician is about $135,000. Uh, you add four more years of genetics and biochemical training to that, and the starting salary is $135,000. <laughs> yeah, um, and that's, that's polling. In, I did this from internal polling. I actually have got my salaries up to over one fifty dollars now, but we did this two, three years ago. Most pediatricians have progressed now from their 135 to 175 a year in salary. That's according to the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, so most fellowship residency salaries are under 60,000. So just by staying that four more years, you've given up $300,000 in salary income. Um, the gap widens because wages are pretty flat in academics. Um, and if you're in private practice, they tend to be a little more incentive driven. Best estimate we can come up with is to become a clinical geneticist, you give up $1.5 million in salary over a general pediatrician who um, is also working really, really hard, but hasn't the degree of training you have. It's only money. It's only money, yeah. And that's why you guys are in this room, and that's why there's so many empty seats. <laughs> the other thing, of course, is burnout. Um, I've actually had to get several of the rare disease pharmas to promise not to hire any more biochemical geneticists as medical directors because otherwise we're going to lose everybody. Um, we've got a bunch of problems, work-life balance, uh, reimbursement systems, payer approval, conflicting priorities, understaffing, understaffing of support staff. So how many of you who are trained in the wiles of uh, genetics actually end up being a file clerk half the time and calling to get, yeah, yeah all of us are going to raise your hand on this one. Um, and then, you know, there's research barriers, and then there's our lovely electronic health records, which have so streamlined our lives and made them better. Um, I said that with a straight face. Um, you know, we talk about the meaningful use program. We call it the meaningless use program. So this is kind of what we're, it's like we're down in a trench and we're digging a ditch, um, and the dirt just kind of keeps falling in on us. This is what we need to be doing instead. We need a power ditch digger. So we're trying an experiment. I don't know if it's going to work, but I'm eight years into it, and it seems to be going okay so far, that we just kind of moved up to a next level. So a couple of things. I have no problem stealing boldly from other successful fields. So a lot of the models we're working with, we stole from cystic fibrosis. And considering the CF Foundation, which did this, is now sitting on $3 billion because of some of their efforts, not a bad model to look at. Um, one of the things we've done is we tend to be very isolated and siloed from place to place to place. I haven't, sadly enough, I don't know a lot of you out there, and I spent most of my career in the southeastern United States. I was at, at Vanderbilt there. And in the northeast, I can tell you, boy, it's even more siloed uh, than it is in the southeast. Um, so one thing we're looking at doing is actually creating a definition from an outside body of clinical centers of excellence in rare disease, with the idea being that perhaps one of the core focuses of our field can be genetic rare disease. We can do precision medicine and all these other things, but you know the second you generate that data, either the oncologists are going to swoop it away or the cardiologist or whoever. And really what we do best is rare disease. So what are these centers? Nord is coming up with some definitions on that. I've had the privilege of serving on Nord's board now for a couple of years, and it's been a very interesting project. They're putting together some really nice patient longitudinal natural history registries with FDA that have some real teeth and some real power to them and don't cost a million dollars a year to run. 
So a lot of things like that are going on right now. What's our institute? So our missions, how do you know, what's the medical home for all these rare disease patients? You know, these, these folks, you know, we're going to diagnose them. You break it, you buy it. And we're used to diagnosing them and then kind of saying, nah, that's fine, have a great life. Um, but no, there's really nobody else to follow them for a lot of them. I mean, like I said, some of them have natural homes. But for a lot of these patients, we're it. So we have to kind of migrate from becoming a, I thought deeply and came up with a brilliant diagnosis to, I did that part, and now I've got to take care of you for the next 50 or 60 years, working with your primary care providers, working with your other specialists, but somebody's got to help steer the boat. And I think that's what we're going to have to morph into. Um, as the economies and different things changes, you know, the reimbursement for that may actually become better uh, as more complex care models come out into the, uh, the economics on this. But I mean, we're working on things like how do you shorten time to diagnosis? How do you standardize treatment protocols? And we're not reinventing the wheel. There's a lot of this information out there already. Just actually pulling it into the practice environment has been one of the challenges we're trying to do. And you know, the other nice thing is we have the luxury of experimenting with our clinical model. If I lose $1,300 every time I see a patient say, I want to try something a little different, there are not many people said, no, no, we want you to keep losing $1,300 per patient. So we're doing a lot more digital work. We're seeing a lot of patients remotely when we can. It's also better for the patients. Some patients just don't travel well. Um, we're trying to use triage tools, either from phone-based apps where a physician can quickly put in some data. We give an opinion back in about 24 hours whether that patient needs to come on in or not, or if they need to come in emergently. It also increases kind of some of the um, false positive, false negative in your referral rate. You know, if you're a busy pediatrician, you're seeing 40 patients a day, and uh, you see one that you think looks abnormal, and you say, God, I've got 40 more patients to see. I don't have time to get on the phone with a geneticist, talk to him. It's going to take me 20, 30 minutes to do that. I'll just refer him. Or the opposite, where, oh, God, I've got 40 more patients, so you don't have time to get on the phone with him. I'll just watch this, and it's something they shouldn't have watched. We're trying to lower the pain threshold for them to actually get an opinion for that. And I think some of our other thought specialty uh, folks are going to be doing that, too. Durham's been doing this for a long time. Uh, so this isn't, like I said, none of this is new. Some of it's just kind of common sense. Some of it is the fact that we've got to figure out how to make our clinical systems work better. I mean, most of our clinical practice models are based around a 1960s Medicare model, which is for doing certain things, you get a food pellet. So we push the space bar to get the food pellet. The problem is we're pushing the space bar that gets you an electric shock. So we actually need to actually think, okay, we need to re-engineer this a little bit. Um, and I think this is something we can do. I think the field's going to grow that way. And we've got to get the salaries up for our trainees and the new docs coming in. I mean, it's not fair that they spend that much more time, take an economic hit to do that. Then we put them in a practice where they're getting killed because they're on call all the time. You know, it, I, it, I kind of laugh because sometimes if you've got a group that's four to five geneticists, which is a good sized group these days, and they say, we're going to protect 70% of your time to do research, you're lying because you can't, because patients will always trump uh, bench, because you've got a sick kid coming in, someone's got to take care of them. All right, times are changing. You know, uh, no matter what happens to the Affordable Care Act, on which side of the fence you are on this, a lot of that's going to be here to stay. I don't think there's going to be rollback of pre-existing condition. You're going to start looking at bundled payments to systems, so in other words, value-based, things like that. So. The traditional model of a children's hospital where you make your money with butts and beds, suddenly that may actually completely flip on them. So there could be a, a call, we'll call it the period of pain if that happens. The problem is for quality-based care in pediatrics and particularly in rare disease, it's really hard to measure that. You know, it's hard to know what, how do you actually put metrics on seven, 8,000 different diseases. Less care will be provided in hospitals and physicians' offices. Technology will start doing more and more. I'm following a lot of the stuff that uh, Amazon is doing. I don't know if y'all heard this. I just hired for their, I think it's Berkshire Hathaway, Amazon, and I can't remember who the third group is. They're going to start a big healthcare program right now. They just hired Atul Gawande to be the director for it. So I think we'll be seeing some very interesting things coming out in those models. Precision medicine, God, I wish I knew what that meant. Um, you know, it's like, let, are we doing imprecise? Maybe we just kind of throw darts at the patient now. Um, I think really this kind of boils down to pharmacogenetics is where most of the money's going to be in this. 
the rest of it will be, you know, if you tell me I got a 5% risk of dying of a stroke when I'm in my 80s over what everybody else, if I stop eating everything I love to eat between now and then, yeah, probably not going to happen. Uh, and then, you know, there's all kinds of interesting things out there. We do have friends. There are a lot of organizations like Nord and others who kind of will have our back. If we work with them, they will work with us. Um, you know, we've uh, been doing, making some strides around getting formula covered. They, uh, TRICARE now, there's a bill on the books where TRICARE now has to pay for metabolic disease formulas for patients in military families. Uh, Senator McCain's health policy director got that dropped into last year's um, Defense Reauthorization Act. There's a companion bill. I know. <laughs> I live in D.C. This is, this is what we eat for dinner. Um, the Orphan Drug Act 2.0 is coming up. Um, there's a Nord FDA natural history program. Um, NAR Hills, and when your folks call locally, local stories are always more powerful when you're trying to change policy than other. Mike, would you agree with that? I mean, having patients but physician stories as opposed to somebody coming saying, here's aggregate data. Um, but if you can say, this child did well, it doesn't always make the most sense because passion doesn't always lead to good bills, but it does actually have an impact. So if you get called to come up and testify or come up and work with your representatives, do so. It will make a difference. In parting, workforce needs some work. Financial needs some toughness from us. We have to be willing um, to go to the CFOs and say, you know what? Yeah, you can tell me I lose money all day long, but I make you a lot more than I lose. And they really can't say no to that because they actually know the truth of the matter. They have the numbers. They actually know what's going on there. Um, healthcare is just going to get interesting. Is this a golden age for historians? Yes, for us, it's pretty tough right now. And uh, with that, I am an optimist for those of you who have known me over the years. It's not whether or not the glass is 50% full or empty. The glass is always full. And with the caveat of deep space, we'll leave that one alone. So thank you very much. So I took this picture about 2 o'clock in the morning when there, we had the supermoon in D.C. and it was a crystal clear night. And I wanted, we live about, um, a half a block, about half a mile from the Capitol, so I walked down and got this one. Any questions? So Marshall, that was a great talk. Um, inspiring and a uh, lot to think about. <laughs> yeah. So if we're going to get funds to increase um, training program for sure and for salaries. Where might those funds come from and do you think that pharma, which is making a great deal of money on products, has a responsibility to help uh, enhance the physician team that is going to be using those products? I'll, I'll say yes and yes and with a caveat. So the one thing to remember too, while the margins on the drugs that are out there are pretty good, the failure rate's still pretty high. So they have to eat some development costs and things like that. But I do think it's reasonable, and they actually are stepping up. I know SIMD is getting some funding for fellowships. Um, you know, it's not unreasonable to talk um, to your pharma reps from your region and ask, saying, "Look, you know, you can kind of take the mafia approach. Hey, wouldn't it be a shame if this nice drug you've got?" There was no one left to write a prescription. Uh, you can tell I've been living in the Northeast now for a while. Um, but, uh, you know, I hear all of you practicing your mafioso accents now. I also see the folks from Pharma going, oh, dear God. <laughs> Mike, what you got? So I'm, uh, you know, as I, I don't want to get overly Washingtonian, but uh, <laughs> you know, as you watch what's happening in hospital merger and acquisition, it's all oh, yeah. mer sort of population health now, which is sort of the prevention side. Um, you know, we've got 15 to 20 percent with predispositions that are probably going to be at least identifiable over time. Yeah. So how do you think that's going to impact this, the, the sick person model? I, I expect it'll get worse because all those people are going to be followed by somebody else to see if they become preclinical. Well, I think that's why we kind of have to kind of redraw the boundaries around what we define the field as. And I think it's why rare disease kind of, you know, particularly clinically significant rare genetic disease, of which there is a great plenty of. There's a lot of patients out there. 
probably should be our meat and potatoes. I think a lot of us are going to be involved in these other efforts, but you're exactly right. Once we figure out the associations, once you figure out kind of what the care models are for those, those go back to the primary care providers or the more specialty fields they're in, and that's where it belongs, to be honest. Um, you know, we don't, we are not going to be good at doing general care provision. We don't have enough people for the entire population. So I think the impact will be, it'll be a diversion of resources because everyone calls that genetics as opposed to kind of the rare disease part of that. So we'll see some resource tug of wars at NIH and some other places like that. Um, I think that they are overly optimistic on the financial impact of precision medicine on U.S. healthcare. Because beyond pharmacogenetics, I'm not sure I see any big thumbs sticking up that are going to say, here's where knowing this is going to have a huge impact on your health care costs. But I think we're going to spend a lot of money to find that out. Yeah. But, you know, I think it looks like, it looks a lot like the newborn screening service did with the nurse practitioner running it. And that may be the way you get efficiency out of the yeah. sort of predisposition side that one pass through. Yeah, we can definitely, and then counseling, counseling and, um, the reason we use our nurse practitioner and our newborn screening is that's protocol driven. And that is ideal in a nurse practitioner type practice. Um, she also follows some of the PKU patients, things like that. But, um, and the, a lot of the precision medicine will be protocol driven as well. How did your counselors generate $400,000 in earnings? Billing. We actually are allowed to bill through the hospital. We bill it as a hospital service. Are they licensed in? No. So they're not licensed and they're billing for yeah, they, primarily they put, cancer? No. Remember, we team all of our counselors up with the physicians. So we have pretty much every patient new that comes in the door is also seeing a genetic counselor. Um, we found around the testing issues, things like that, it makes it so much smoother. The families get a lot better information. You know, most people do that, but I'm not sure that most people are billing Yeah, the hospital gives it. Physician. The hospital charges each patient who comes in a hospital fee, and our cut comes out of that. Um, we're getting licensures in there, and my, my, my counselors now have to have NPIs and everything else. The collection rate's only about 40%. It's not great, but it's better than nothing. Yeah. Marshall, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. I Thanks had to me. get up because I saw, I, in, even though the nutrition data is like really, really a drop in the bucket in the whole picture, but is there any data on the medical food um, piece or the nutrition services with the newborn screening model with your nurse right. practitioner? Any data on that? Um, it's, I, I just simply didn't put it into this particular model because I support my nutritionists out of the grants we get from the state. And so that's uh, one of the ways I make up some of our gaps is we do contracting with state of Virginia, state of Maryland for fixed fee to actually cover some of those things. Um, those are actually key critical members of the program, but in this economic model, um, you can't really work them in because there's really no model for billing and recovery for nutrition that makes, that really rises above. I think, I think we're I, probably out of time, but just one quick thing sure. is that you had mentioned nurse practitioner, and I know in Milwaukee, uh, Donald Basil hired, I think, five nurse practitioners, and that model has served him very well. Yeah, I think, though, when you're doing complex diagnostics or measuring, managing complex metabolic patients, that model gets iffy kind of quick. I think for routine things, newborn screening, following patients, like PKU, things like that, where there is a little bit of routine to it, it makes sense. I worry that we may actually be extending them beyond their practice envelope, though. That was fun. By the way, it's good to see y'all. <laughs>